feel like that. I feel like that intro makes it like sets really high expectations. So, and I'll, to be honest, I was actually really paranoid. Um, in deciding to, to say something and talk because there's probably about, I don't know, 15 of you in this audience who I ask, like, so who exactly is going to be coming to this thing and how can I actually help them? You know, is it going to be that helpful for me to come up and just talk about good and hopefully a lot of you know about Good Magazine and Good That Is and, and all that type of stuff. And so I, for me, I felt like, you know, it's maybe not so valuable to talk about that and like necessarily what I do, but more just in terms of like my being this kind of I don't know, person who's trying to balance like the job with my life, with my passions, and how I'm trying to bring it all together and make sense of it. I mean, a lot of times it just feels like a grind. And I think really all you need to know about what I do for work, and to give some context to this, is basically I head up partnerships and revenue are good, which means I'm the sales guy. <laughs> um, and I'll just put it up there up front. I'm the sales guy. And my job basically is to bring in this, you know, bring in a lot of money to fund good and because we've never gotten any like outside funding or VC funding it's all based on sort of the revenue that I and my team bring in and I was saying this the other night we have 73 employees and I if anyone is and, and there's probably a lot of people in this room who have started something or are starting something but every time you add a staff member or acquire you know, a projector or something you just start to feel like it's yours and you feel like you have a personal responsibility to it so I've gotten to the point now with Good where we're 73 employees and I feel individually responsible for creating and, and, and helping to fund this thing so they can do good in the world. And I'm the first to admit to say that I don't know the best way to do good in the world, but I'm happy to help others who know how to, to do it. So that's a little context. I, I hope what I'm going to talk through here does add or provide some value to you guys from a standpoint of balancing the daily grind and doing what you want to do. And I think all those things are things we believe in, but how do we actually go about doing it? You may see this and be... I'm going to say, this is total BS. This doesn't work for me. Well, let's give it a shot. So tell me what you guys think. So uh, you can tell I, I paid the, uh, the creative team. I gave them all bonuses that come up with a really cool name for this thing here. So I didn't, I didn't know a name to call it, but this is just what I do. So basically, there are a lot of people who see their lives and their work like this, right? At any given moment, you have a lot of things to do, a lot of responsibilities, um, and a lot of things you can do for your own life personally. And the thing about this, what I call kind of more of a web approach, is just basically nothing is more important or less important than the other. It's just, it's there. And at any given moment, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and you deal with it, and you're on to the next thing, and you kind of have this encompassing approach of, here's all the things I'm doing. Other people take this approach. And I think this is probably most people who kind of say, in any given hour, day, week, year, these are my priorities, and these will shift over time. But for now, this is what I'm thinking. There's a clear relationship between what's most important and how they change. Now, whoever this is clearly doesn't value the parents in, in, in the way that, that you've learned to value yours. <laughs> but nonetheless, this might be their list of how they do it. So this is what I call I can have it all. And it's literally to say, I can do everything. It can be my top priority. I can balance it all. And my life is going to be wonderful. And so. There's probably a lot of overachievers, a lot of people in this room who, um, who think that this is very reasonable. And great, good for you. I've, success I've not been successful in doing this by any means. So, uh, so ultimately then, well, what is my approach? And how do I see things? And, and, uh, and it's essentially this. So this is my life today. And like any good Christopher Nolan movie, you got to start at the end first and then kind of work your way back to how you got here. So, you know, so basically, this is kind of how I see my life today. And you'll notice there's, there's, there's this uh, distinction between, obviously, what's at the top, and not, no, not necessarily ordered in terms of what's more important, not left to right or nothing, just what's up here and what's down here. There's definitely a, a, a gap there for a reason. So we'll go through why. This is, again, this is how sort of I sort of define it and sort of how my, and it's funny because, it, and I feel like a lot of these presentations have been very self-reflective. And again, like I'm hoping in this process that I'm actually going to, I can help you guys. But this is sort of what I distilled as sort of my, my approach to it. So the symbol of essentially choosing three and only three things in your life to tie your happiness, fulfillment, and pride to. It's not just prioritizing them. It's actually taking a step back and saying, you know what, I can commit to these things. These things are most important to me, and everything else doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And it's not to say you shirk your responsibilities or you never engage in those things. 
But let's be very clear about what makes you happy, what makes you fulfilled. And let's focus on that. And what you're going to come to see is this last part, that you, when you do this, it actually is amazing sort of the, 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 sort of the consequence, the positive consequence of that type of a hyper-focus. So you're, probably, you're either thinking right now, well, maybe there's something here you're saying, this guy is, who is this guy to tell me how to live my life? But let me just kind of talk about how I went through this, and then hopefully, again, there's some resonance with you guys. So how did this all come about? Well, this was one extreme. And I feel like so many of these decks, by the way, are like, here's, like, here's some old pictures of me, and here's how I've changed. But <laughs> so I just wanted to continue that theme. So here's sort of uh, one extreme of sort of that approach, which is essentially if all three of those were cycling. Because I, so I used to be a professional cyclist. was my job. I, you know, I got paid to race my bike and, and essentially be an athlete and be a machine. And all I had to do was focus on racing. That's it. What I ate, how much I slept, what I did, only had to all be towards the singular focus. And there's probably a lot of you know, some of us in this room now who feel like they are that way. Everything they do is geared towards one purpose. Well, that's one extreme. And it's, it's one thing at maybe the expense of all others. And I just throw these up here because, well, I really like that picture of me. But uh, <laughs> in this one, I feel like a badass because I'm actually crashing. You can see me right there because this, this dude got down. Thanks a lot. And then, um, and really what these other things meant, like I couldn't drink, didn't touch a drop of alcohol during my five years as a pro. Couldn't, I, in my contract, I couldn't do anything that caused like extra or, or like possible danger, damage to my body. Couldn't go on ski vacations, couldn't do things with my family. I had to weigh all my food. Literally, I was the only kid in college with a digital scale who wasn't a drug dealer. <laughs> so, so, so here I am showing up to the, to the calf, and I got my digital scale, and I'm tearing the plate, and I'm weighing all my food because I have to track every single meal and report it back to the team nutritionist. And if I missed my body fat percentage goals, I didn't get paid for a month. That was reality. And, and you know, it was, it was like, you know, I don't want to, you know, cry champagne problems because I got to, you know, race my bike or whatever and, and be a kid for a while. But it's, it's really one of these things where uh, there was a lot that I had to sacrifice to do this. And again, some of us might be in this mode right now where, you know, and it actually kind of bums me out to, to think about some of these things where I think about it now and as I was doing this in college and after college, there were definitely maybe social connections or relationships that I shirked or, or that I didn't develop because of this. And another sad story, another one which always kind of just haunts me to this day, and she never lets me live it down, but I, got, I came home for, for Christmas uh, one year, and um, my mother was actually just fighting a cold. And as soon as I heard her talk when I saw her, when I came home, like, I, I didn't hug her. Like, I was just like, oh, I can't, because if I get sick, then I can't do my job. And in about four weeks, I had to go to South America to do a race. I mean, it's just like, it was literally that type of a commitment that I made. And some of you maybe think I'm a real jerk, but, but, uh, but it was a singular focus. And again, some of us may be in the same now. And ultimately, the reason why I retired at the tender age of 23 was because, you know, it wasn't because I didn't enjoy it or love it, but I did realize that this was not a way that I wanted to live. I was burnt out, essentially, right? So this is the other extreme. When I decided to retire, I moved to LA. I didn't have a job, didn't have a place to live, didn't have any friends. All I knew that I, I just didn't want to live anywhere cold. So, so I just thought, oh, what the hell, I moved to LA. And so I showed up there and was just thrown into the city. And you know, it was just completely overwhelming from the standpoint of I literally had no social fabric or no job offer or anything, but I wanted to give it a shot. And for me, it was one of these things where I just, I was so overwhelmed, I had to figure it all out. And in a, in, a, in a kind of a group therapy session, what I'm going to tell you guys is a story where I, I was literally sitting down with my girlfriend at the time. We were just talking about it. And contrary to the masculine figure that you see in front of you right now, I just started bawling and weeping. Because I was like, I just don't get it. Like, I, don't, I, 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 have, I have so many things I need to do, but I have no value or no ability to like, then produce what I need to produce to live a, a good life here. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm here. And you know, my parents were, were kind of the hardcore ones and maybe in a passive aggressive way of getting back from me for not hugging my mom. You're cut off after college. You're on your own. Like, no help, nothing, um, which is fine. Like, I, it was, yeah, I totally accepted that. And so here I was in the situation where I went from a singular focus to now having no focus and feeling like I had all these things to do. 
So I decided, that I, the, the funny thing about that and why I bring that up is because I feel like I was a life in transition. And for me, this space, this downtown project, this area, is, is a great metaphor for maybe some of us in this room, which is in a sense like we are in a place of transition, and whether it's professionally, whether it's personally. Uh, but we're making this pivot for some reason or the other. And I was certainly in that place going from, uh, a, a singular focused athlete to now figuring out how I'm going to you know, find a place to live, what I'm going to do, and, and I had no skills. I mean, you, know, you don't ride a bike and all of a sudden you, know, you can get a, a marketing job or something. So, um, so I was clear in a life in transition. And I'll run through this quickly because what I decided to do, which was a really, for me, a, 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 an approach that I, I often took with racing, was like, okay, let's forget what I don't know. Let's forget what, you know, what my health is going to be or, or, or where I'm going to be in a certain point during the season, but let's focus on what I do know. Like, these are realities. Like, I'm not, I don't want to put any kind of lofty notions of like, you know, I, I pursued a dream and to, to, you know, to be an actor and this is, no, it's just basically this is what I need to do, right? And it's all of these things. And it starts to feel overwhelming at a certain point. And the key one, the key two was, Happiness begets success because the, con the, the, the counter to that is you know, more money, more problems. But you know, I figure you know, happiness actually creates more success than success creates happiness. And the last one is uh, I need to make some friends. <laughs> so, so knowing all these things, I just decided to myself, you know what? Everything's better in threes. And the reason why I came up with this was because, I mean, I feel like there's probably been you know, a handful of talks already where people are like, three reasons, or three things, or we do three things. Uh, Noah said, you know, Feastly does three things, you know? And it's just like, and I had this professor in college who had worked in the White House, and he said, one, you can't make an argument with one point. Two is flimsy. Four is too many. No one's going to remember. So three is just right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think they teach you that in your SAT class, too, probably, and stuff like that. So I decided to myself, well, let me just distill all these things and focus on three things that I want to do, that I'm going to commit myself to and screw everything else. It doesn't matter. I just want to choose three things that I can get through, that I can assign clear goals to, that I can measure, and that I feel are really going to get me to a place where I'm going to find some level of foundation and, and happiness. And essentially what happened then is in doing these things, by getting to know LA as a key priority, I developed community ties. And that meant that I developed a love for where I live. Right? In making friends, that's how I ultimately got to good. So what I decided to say is like, the only way I'm going to make friends in LA is if I actually reach out to my other friends and see who they know in LA and get out of my comfort zone and decide that I have to actually do something to meet people. And hopefully in that process, something serendipitous would happen. And next thing you know, through friends, I met the other guys and Good was born. And that created a love for where I work. And ultimately, making a living, because you know, this is like you know, you're, that voice in the back of your head that's just like, well, you got to pay for bills, and you know, maybe you should save some money. And it just allowed me sort of a freedom to pursue what I love. But again, there's, you'll notice there's definitely things that are missing here, like a job that I love, like, well, my girlfriend's down there now. Well, there was a reason we broke up, but she's down there. So <laughs> um, it was a long distance thing. I was like, no, but uh, you know, and other things too, like you know, it's just sort of like you know. Uh, there's these things down here which like, I, I just didn't prioritize, and I decided that these are the three things that would make me happy. So then, now from that point, once I established those things, the question was like, okay, well at a certain point you've got to grow and you've got to move on. So then it, from a life in transition, I felt like, okay, now I actually have to grow and develop. So again, it's doing this exercise again. Many of these things are the same, but then I decided to say, okay, well, well now that I actually have a foundation, now that I actually have friends, now that I actually have freedom, like, what can I actually do? Right? And then I felt, I decided to myself that, you know, you know, these sort of things towards the end were a really key critical part of what I wanted to put out in the world and what I wanted to embody. So then we, go to the, we get to this. Again, it, it's one of these things where it's like, again, going back to, the, to the, the, my original hypothesis, which is this idea that if you only focus on three things and, and give yourself permission to say nothing else matters, but only these three, these three things, and I'm going to devote my sense of happiness and fulfillment to them, 
then it's actually something really interesting happens. So as I developed and as I built a foundation, I decided, good, like I said before, my job is, is you know, I'm a sales guy, so I gotta make money to keep it going, and I love the company, I love what we do, and I love the people that work there. You know, my family, because as you notice in the other one, that that wasn't a priority, in a sense of like, I needed to approach it or attack it like a goal to make it something that would make me feel fulfilled and happy. Uh, but always call your mother, of course, uh, so. Um, and my health, and I decided health is wealth. And I decided that now in this space, I could shift my priorities and again, only say these three things are important. So ultimately though, the question is, what am I missing, right? Clear, like, I don't know, romantic sense. I, by the way, I derive all my notions of love from Nicholas Sparks books. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, love for sure. I mean, not, not one of my three things. Uh, not in the sense of like romantic, like, you know, a, a committed sort of type of relationship for sure. But, you know, all in good time. And also this, which, you know, I was, maybe it's because I was in college or racing that I never really kind of went out a lot. But that, you know, it was just sort of this idea that I, that that aspect of that social scene wasn't a priority for me. So getting back to this and, and kind of bringing this back to a, a close. So if, if everything I just talked about was this idea that it's okay to only commit to three things, and prioritizing them as the only important things. How, how do we then make this connection to like doing that will actually make all the other things fit into a place that is reasonable and, and, and manageable? And, and that's the key thing. It's not to say that those things are necessarily missing, but rather there's a process we've created here that I feel has been incredibly helpful for me to deal with some of these things that are whether stressors or things that I want to do that I don't feel like I necessarily can do. And that's essentially, and I, I had to rip this off, just because, you know, here. I don't know if I have to pay Tony a royalty for using this, by the way, but, but it's this notion of, like, in my sense of happiness and fulfillment, is tied to these three things being successful, and that I feel that if these things aren't going well, it doesn't matter. I mean, we came out of the office one day uh, a few months ago, and someone had broken into our, my car and taken, uh, you know, my, my iPod and stuff. And I, well, first I felt sorry for them because if they listen to my iPod, there's nothing good on it, uh, um, <laughs> except for 80 songs. But uh, you know, so so, but it was just one of these things where it's like, you know, what? It, it all into this perspective. Like, I can deal with that challenge or that obstacle because my frame of mind is tied to these th these three things. And at the same time, the, the, the contrary, or the, the counter to that is, if I'm not happy or if one of these things aren't going well, when, when we hit the recession in 2008, 2009, we were in big trouble at good. It was almost like burn the furniture, like we may not be here around anymore. And like we laid off a bunch of people and it, it was a really hard time. But you can't, it's amazing to think about the amount of heightened focus and, and sense of urgency that you get when you know that these are the only three things you have to worry about. And when you set expectations with all these other things that it's okay if, you know, my dating life isn't as good as I want or if I don't have a pet yet, or if I'm behind on episodes of New Girl, which I always am. But it's just, it's okay, you know? And, and ultimately, though, by creating that sense of happiness, by the way, points for anyone who counts all the cheesy PowerPoint animations, I, I, did, I did that on purpose. But, so, but it's okay that if you find that happiness and you find that sense of fulfillment, essentially, I've, I've felt like I've ultimately produced, if those things, if I'm developing those things because of these, I'm putting out into the world and able to manage these things down here a lot better only because I've developed this confidence, this patience, and then ultimately a sense of enjoyment that like these things all fit into a place. Um, and so in that regard, a you know, $15 million revenue number or something for good isn't necessarily daunting as much as it is a challenge that I want to go after to make, to, to feel like I'm fulfilled, to feel like I'm accomplishing something. And that begets these, these, these emotions, confidence, patience, and enjoyment in return. So finally, what I'll say, is that, you know, did I just, did I just kill it? I think I just killed it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, whether it's sort of this approach or, you know, it's this approach, sort of this web approach or this priority list or even sort of this thing. I think really, you know, for me, it's like if you just take a moment to think about sort of like, you know, that if, if you take a moment to consider sort of like that one ex that, that experience or those few experiences where you felt like you accomplished something that made you feel incredibly fulfilled or you're pursuing a new career and how much do you want to devote to it and where does that fit in context to other things. For me, it's just sort of this exercise of like, it's amazingly, it's, it's, it's incredible how free you can feel once you give yourself permission to 
focus on the three things that you feel are going to make you happy and fulfilled. And it's not that you're going to ultimately miss out on these things or, or, or that you'll, you won't ever get to them. But it's ultimately creating a new state of mind that ultimately f positions them as being a lot more manageable and enjoyable in some ways. So I don't know. I feel like for me, I just wanted to kind of take an approach to, to talking in some way that just sort of just like, here's how I've sort of lived my life in this place of dealing with all these things, having to balance certain responsibilities to company, to clients, to uh, uh, employees, um, and to myself. And I think just choosing three, not at the expense of the others, but choosing three um, as the only things um, and the others as all in good time or all in their place is incredibly liberating in a lot of ways. So hopefully that's of some help to at least one person in this room. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, great. <laughs>